the book of Ephesians. We've gone through this entire letter, uh, but it should not surprise you that if I'm going to preach a message on uh, Father's Day, and particularly this message, Fathers as Disciple Makers, uh, that we would come back to this passage and look at it. By the way, do we have any great-grandfathers here? I, see, I thought that, Lynn, after I said that. Stand up, Lynn, just real quickly. A great-grandfather. Now, what is, yes, thank the Lord for that. I've said this to you, I've said it about great-grandmothers. The Scripture says one of the great blessings of God is you shall see your children's children. You shall see your grandchildren. Great blessing. To see your children's children's children is a phenomenal blessing. We were with my sister recently, my 81-year-old sister, whose health is beginning to be challenging. And in August, God willing, she will be a great, great, great grandmother. I don't think I've ever seen one of those. I may just drive to Texas just to look at her when that happens. Amazing. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. Stand with me if you would. I hope you've found that in your Bible. If, if you don't have a Bible with you, see me after the service. We want to try to do our best to get one in your hands. But just in case, I don't want you just to listen. I want you to absorb the whole experience here. Ephesians 6, 1 to 4. We've got it on the screens. Follow along if you would as I read this text. Paul has just come through this being filled with the Spirit looks like. Talking about husbands and wives, that critical relationship. And he turns to children and parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. That it may go well with you, and then you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We've read together the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And may the Lord help us today to just regroup, retool, re-energize, recommit as fathers, as men who have the opportunity to have an impact on, on those within our reach, under our charge, to be disciple makers. Thank you. Please be seated. You know, you talk to enough people. I, I read a paper, by the way, by Matt Morrison. Matt did a paper on, on what a biblical father is, submitted it to his, uh, he's doing uh, Bible classes online, and, and he made an observation there that I've encountered uh, quite a bit. It, you, you get some of the strangest ideas from guys about what being a husband is and about what being a father is. Uh, it's amazing. I, I came across this. A friend of mine posted this this week. Just to give you an idea of how, how guys sometimes don't, <laughs> we don't think it through. Uh, after 35 years of marriage, a husband and wife came for counseling. When asked what the problem was, the wife went into a tirade, listening, listing every problem they had ever had in the years they'd been married. On and on and on. Neglect, lack of intimacy, emptiness, loneliness, feeling unloved and unlovable. An entire laundry list of unmet needs that she had endured. Finally, after allowing this for a sufficient length of time, the therapist got up, walked around the desk, and after asking the wife to stand, he embraced and kissed her long and passionately as her husband watched with a raised eyebrow. The woman shut up and quietly sat down in a daze. The therapist turned to the husband and said, this is what your wife needs at least three times a week. Can you do this? He answered, well, I can drop her off here on Mondays and Wednesdays, <laughs> but I fish on Fridays. Just, you know, we don't, have to, we don't have to just fly by the seat of our pants, guys. The scripture has given us some great guidance on, uh, on relationships, husbands to wives, in the, in the passage previous to this. But this passage here, parenting, I'll tell you, I think about the things I've done in my life. And I, won't, I won't list them. I'm not going to go through like Paul's resume because I, I don't want to toot my own horn, but just 
the challenges of different things. But when, when the list is completed, I've never done anything that is as challenging as parenting. I've never done anything that, that, that in the task, and now, now engaging in, in parenting at a grandparent level, that does more to show me the glorious character of God and my character flaws than parenting. It's taught me a lot about the gospel, how gracious God is to me, his child, and how I need to parent by grace. I confess to you, my, my children, you could, you could talk to them. When we were younger in marriage, didn't know this, but I was a Pharisee. I was a Pharisee. Uh, I've repented to my children <laughs> several times. The, the, the biggest conf confrontation I had was when we took men's fraternity here for the first time, and I stared in the face my um, need to repent. So I've repented to my children uh, for those earlier days, and I thank God that his grace overcomes even uh, deficient parenting. When a, when a parent's heart, and this is the good news I want to tell you, when your heart, your heart is to see your children grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. God takes that. I was thinking about Father's Day gifts. And if someone were to ask me, what would be the greatest Father's Day gift somebody could give you? John, 3 John 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth no greater joy. I promise you, God has no greater joy than to see his children, men and women, boys and girls, saved by grace through faith, walking in the truth. That's our heart's desire, and I believe God gives us that ultimately. Parenting is not for cowards. You've got to be in it for the long haul. I'll tell anybody, if you're, if you're excited about being a parent because you want to hear your children say nice things about you, uh, strap in. Happy. It's for the long haul. So I want to see two things in this passage today. Uh, first of all, the challenge of fathers as disciple makers, verses 1 to 3. And secondly, the course for fathers as disciple makers. The challenge is actually, it comes out of Paul's admonition to children. I want to say something about this. When Paul, remember this is a letter Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. He expected the children to be in the assembly of worship within the hearing of this letter being read. He does not say, tell your children, or actually address his children. Now, children, I want to say something to you for a minute. I know that it's tough when you, when you can spend uh, time on, in front of a TV, on a tablet, a smartphone, and you can watch all these things come at you uh, just 90 to nothing, lots of colors, lots of noises, lots of angles. I know that sitting and listening to someone like me speak for half an hour or more can be a great challenge. I recognize that. Okay? But it's God's means. And so children in the first century were taken into the gathering of the people for worship, Sometimes their services went long. Eutychus was a young man sitting in a window for an evening service. He fell asleep and fell out of it onto the ground. Sometimes they can go long. I know that. But I want to challenge you. Paul says, children, obey. And so he expects you to listen to this. Obey your parents in the Lord. Children are never asked to obey parents who are asking them to do something or insisting they do something that would not honor God. No child is responsible to do that either. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It's the right thing to do. 
talked with children enough through the years, my own children, grandchildren, other people's children. Very often, the discussion for them is about what they want, not about what is right. And so we need to recognize, children, that we too as adults struggle with what we want. But we always have to bring it back under the microscope. Is it right? Does it, does it come up as right in God's standard, in God's truth? It is right. It's not always pleasant. The Hebrew writer says this. There's no discipline is pleasant for the moment, but it's right to obey. This word has the notion of, of listening with a commitment to doing. Then the reason he says this, he gives you the principle and then he gives you the biblical basis for it. It's right out of the fifth commandment. Honor your father and mother. Then he just says parenthetically, this is the, the first commandment with a promise. In other words, it is, it is of utmost importance and has a promise to it. I don't want to go back through my, my series I preached on the Ten Commandments, but I want to remind you, the fifth commandment is a bridge commandment. The first four commandments, no other gods, no idols, don't take God's name in vain, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Those first four clearly have to do with, with our relationship to God, what we call the, the vertical aspect. Number six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't covet. Have to do with the horizontal aspect, our relationship to one another. First four, relationship to God. Last six, relationship to one another. The fifth commandment is a bridge commandment. Honor father and mother. That's clearly relationship. But it's talking about relationships and our, our role in that. And God is the ultimate relationship. So it actually, in order to honor God, we've got to honor father and mother. And so it, it bridges the two. It combines elements of both our relationship to God and our relationship to one another, to fellow man. And Paul cites this. This is the biblical basis for his, he, he's just gone through several verses of how a husband ought to love his wife, as Christ loved the church, the wife ought to submit to her husband as unto the Lord. And he talks about that mutual relationship they have of love and respect. And children, there's a warning in the, in the book of Isaiah, or in the prophets. They will fear the children. The parents will fear the children. And I don't know if you've seen that or not, but I've seen it. I've seen it in the marketplace. I've seen it in the counseling chamber. And it shows you that a society can drift a long way. What's my point? My point is we're growing in, 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 a, in a day in the 21st century when, uh, when, when genders and roles are just so messed up in public. And we've got to hold the line. So Paul is giving children these instructions that it may go well with you that you may live long in the land. Well, uh, you know, Paul, Paul lived in a day, if you want to look at some just quick verses here, Romans 1.30, where he says, here's the culture we live in, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. It was just sort of, it was the mark of that day. He said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.2, People will be lovers of self, and it's interesting because you, you, they use the word love in the Greek. It's, it's self-love, money love, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. Look around. That's the day we live in. And here we come in to be fathers, to be disciple makers. And so he, he gives of these children, this, this promise that it may go well with you. That clearly in the context that he's drawing from there, it was for the children of Israel in Deuteronomy being promised that, that if they obeyed God, he would take them into the land. But there's a, there's a spiritual application because we are the people of God. We're the spiritual Israel to be taken into the ultimate land, the ultimate promised land. Look at these just real quickly. 
Hebrews 11.10 talks about Abram. He, he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. That it may go well with you, that you may, that you may live long in the land. Not, not live long in heaven, but live in heaven. That that may be the extension. This what David says in Psalm 23, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that term there is for length of days, that, that I will go to that place where I will dwell for for a long time, forever and ever and ever, and it will be a good place. And that's what he's talking about here. Hebrews 11, 13 and 16, just write down the page there. These all died in faith, not having received things promised, but having seen them, greeted them from afar, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Are you feeling more and more of that, by the way? Strangers and exiles. I'm going to tell you something. I have practically stopped watching any news except the local weather. And I've got an app now called Weather Live. I can watch the weather on that. I just, I watch the news and, I, and they're coming up on the wrong side of so many issues. Exiles. For people who speak thus, make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they'd been thinking of that land from which they'd gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. Notice how he's talking about how this that it may go well with you in the land. It's the ultimate land here. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. He's prepared for them a city. Then Hebrews 13, 14. We, for here, we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. And then Romans 4, 13. The promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the wor world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith, so there's this, this, uh, this challenge. What I, what Paul says to children, children, listen to me. What Paul says to children is the heart's desire of every parent I know who loves God. I've never met a parent who loves God who says, "Well, you know, whether my kids obey or not, it's not a big deal." Whether no. And what I really want for them is a good education. If I can get them a good education, get them a good job. No, so those things, those things go way back to the back of the bus. This is the challenge. God gives us children. He gives children to Christian homes. And then to show the abundance of His grace, He rescues children who were not born into Christian homes and brings them into Christian homes and does that in many different ways. One of them is He saves their parents. One of them is these children are adopted. Got some good friends who are trying to adopt their second uh, child from Africa. Adoption. The grace of God to take children and place them into Christian homes. And so, so the challenge that we have as fathers who would be disciple makers is to, is to so engage ourselves in the, the blessed task of parenting that we are driven, not as a Pharisee like I was, we are driven by gospel motives for the glory of God to raise children who will value obedience. That means we've got to be willing to correct them. You see, discipline is not only not pleasurable for the person being disciplined, Discipline is not pleasurable for the person administering the discipline. And yet, we, if we know anything from what's happening in public education right now, we know you cannot educate a child where all that is put on the table is the idea of, of instruction without correction. We're going to see this in a minute in this text. We've got to be willing to bring both to bear, to teach them. I hope, I hope at home, dads, that you're taking advantage of a tool, this, this catechism that we've made available, or something like it, if you have something that rises to the level of that. You'll never regret time spent catechizing your child, children. Here's why. Because you're hide, helping them to hide truth in their hearts, and you're learning as well. You're learning theology in bite-sized pieces. When you have a wayward child, and I have one, 
What do you hold out hope for? I know what is stored up in her mind. At one time, I thought it was stored up in her heart. But I know what is stored up in her mind. And if the Father of mercy ever is pleased to breathe upon her, to bring her to the end of herself, she doesn't have to go looking somewhere to encounter truth. There will be floodgates of truth opening up in the dark part of the dungeon of her mind where she has stuffed things back that she knows good and well are true, but now is living as if they are not true. But if she didn't have that there, then my prayer would be, oh dear God, I didn't do it. Please bring somebody along who, who will speak the truth to her. And I pray that too, by the way. It would be wonderful if someone, some, some precious prophet-like encounters her and says, I'm talking about you. You're the one that's deep in sin. That would be wonderful. But, but see, that doesn't even have to happen because from childhood, the training, the instructing, it's there. And God can set that kindling. She, she can pour cold water on that just like Elijah poured it on them at Mount Carmel. But when the fire of God falls, he, it will consume the kingdom. That's critical. The challenge we have, Dad, it's, it's not small. I've said this to you before. I'll say it every time we come to these kind of settings. You can look around. You can, you can look at everything physically that you possess in terms of houses and lands and cars and and bank accounts and positions and on and on and on and on. Titles. But the only, and I'm going to use this, the only thing, and I'm using the word thing in a, in a redemptive way, the only thing or things we have any hope of taking from this life to heaven with us are the children God gave us. And as your life expands, the, gr the grandchildren God gave you, the great-grandchildren, these are the only, quote, things that will survive the fire. And they will go somewhere. They will go somewhere. So the challenge is there. Thank God he hadn't left us groping in the dark, however. The, the course is laid out too. This course, if a father's going to be a disciple maker, when he says in verse 4, fathers do not, so he gives them a do not, then he gives them a do. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction or the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The challenge to exhort, exhortation to children, which becomes the challenge to the fathers about their obedience. Obedience doesn't save them, but it is a measure, as I try to say to my, to my grandchildren now. I will know when you're serious about the things of God when I see you getting serious about being a blessing to your parental unit, all right? I'll know that. When that's not there, I'll talk with you till the cows come home about the gospel and becoming a Christian. But when I see you honoring God by committing to bless mom and dad, I know something's going on. It's the infallible marker. God's doing a work in a child's heart. This course, though, is here. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. I see. I said a while ago I was a Pharisee. When I was when I was being raised by my dad, unless I've lost some memories, and I can, I, could, I don't think he ever spanked me in any other way than angry. I've told you the episode, I'm not going to go through that again, but it, was, it, would, it would be that. It, would, it was not the idea that I need to subdue the rebellion in you for the glory of God and for the, for the sanity of this household and for the good of your own soul. It wasn't that. I just ticked him off. I stepped over the line. Never knew when it was going to be. But when it was, it was. My mother... Discipline differently. My dad would just snatch his belt off and start swinging, corner me in the house and let me have it. My mother would say, go out to the privet hedge and pick your switch. She's a little psychology in this for me. 
So I'd come back in with a little piece of privet hedge about that big. Here it is. She said, you can go pick it or I can pick it. Sometimes I'd test her, come back. I might get a little something bigger. And she would get up and go with her pruning shears. And she'd find the biggest limb on the privet hedge. Skin it, but they weren't straight. And to the glory of God, would lay into my behind. Over time, I learned, first of all, to obey her. <laughs> Secondly, to be wise, not, not foolish, not smart. I look at my selection of a privet hedge. Because she was going to get the big one for me if I didn't go around. My dad didn't care anything about that. It was just flail away. Well, that was provoking me to anger. Uh, I mean, I saw him get angry, so guess what? When I became a parent, guess what? Because what you do, get dads, and some of you know this, if you don't intentionally dig in to the Scripture, that it saturates you, that it wash over you, that I think one of the words Matt used in, the, in his, his, his paper was marinate in you and in your children, then you'll just default for that. And I did that early on, and I repented my children for that. But when you proactively say, wait a minute, I'm, all I'm doing is saying to my kids, you're not big enough to pitch a fit and get away with it yet. One day you will be. You'll be a parent like me. Rather than do that, to listen to the scriptures. Don't provoke them to anger. But just, see, spanking them in anger is not the only way you provoke children to anger. Being sarcastic with them, cutting them down, belittling them, demeaning them in public. Those things stir up anger or wrath. There's another way that's a little more subtle. And it's about what you don't do. It's the, it's the sins of omission of parenthood. When you don't make the gospel a priority in your home, when you don't make the gospel a priority in your, in your life, in the flow of your life, let me tell you something. If your children grow up thinking that, that being a part of the assembly of the people of God, gathering with the people of God is is not important. What the parents do in moderation, the children, children do in excess. Unless the Lord reaches in and snatches them mightily somehow. So you're, you're cultivating an attitude. It's not open rebellion, but it's just a passive indifference to the kingdom of God. How do I know this? Because now, this youngest generation that's coming up to adulthood, we're getting new terms for them about their religious affiliation. Every one of them will tell you they're spiritual. Talk to them about religious connection. You know what they say? I'm a nun. Not, not N-U-N, not, not a Catholic. I'm a nun. N-O-N-E. I'm a nun. I'm not part of anything. Why? Because I'm done. D-O-N-E. So we have a challenge here, not to provoke them to anger. Either, either actively and in, in, in engaging them in anger and not, not lovingly to the glory of God, or passively by, by neglecting things to shape them and show them what's important. By the way, my children, your children know what's important to you. They do. My prayer for you, for each one of you, is that they will know that the glory of God upon your life, upon your family, upon their lives, that you that being kingdom citizens and being part of something bigger than yourself called the Church of Jesus Christ, that those things are important. They know that. And you can help your children if they're grown, have children of their own, to help them learn to inculcate that. Well, quickly, let me, let me finish here. So we're not to provoke them to, to anger, but we're to raise them in the discipline and instruction. The discipline of the, I was talking about here is the shaping of the will through training all right? Through training. You, you shape it. You shape it. It's the will. Brings it under some... No, you can't do that. Yes, you may do that. You, you, you guide and you guard and you lead and you shape. The second word, instruction, is the shaping of the mind through teaching and admonition. So, so one would tend to be a little more physical in terms of, of like, a, like a sheepdog moving the herd in a certain direction. That's, that's the... Uh, that's the first picture there of discipline. The second is more instruction. 
This is true, this is not. This is a horse, this is a cow. A cow is not a horse. Don't let society tell you they're the same thing but different names. No, here's what the Scripture says. It is where you teach your children by word and example that the Scripture is our authority. That's what we appeal to. It's the final word. Listen, let me, I've got to close with this. Everybody has an authority. Everybody has an authority. People who hate the Word of God have an authority. People who hate authority have an authority. It's got to find out what it is. It's press, and press. Well, where would you get that? Well, what makes you think that? Well, who, who told you that? The only authority that stood the test of time, though, is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. We've got to teach our children that this is, this is the book. Even when they stray from the book, you pray that you've, that you've been purposefully hiding enough of the book in their minds. Like I said a while ago, when the Lord sets the, that on fire, then they will come back to the book. I've seen it happen over and over and over again in my life. People taught better, go astray, come back. One knock on my door one morning, uh, years ago, we were in another place, out in my study. The study was attached to our house. Knock, knock, knock. It's not even daylight yet. <laughs> yes. Can we talk? Come on in. I got to tell you, I hated you. She said, I hated you. Really? Yeah, because of what you were saying, what you were, quote, doing to this church at the time. But she's. My life is coming apart. And I need, I, I know you'll tell me the truth. Will you help me know the truth? You see, in her life in years past, some things have been woven in there that were true. She turned away from it. You see, we're to raise them in the, in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. My prayer, my prayer for you men is that first of all, those of you young, young guys, you young men that are maybe just starting out on the parenting journey, that you won't make some of the ridiculous mistakes I've made. That you will you'll be wiser, more proactively biblical and not so much reactively circumstantial. For those of you like me who, you know, you never, you never threw being a parent. I've learned that. You know, well, I know some guys say, well, you're 18 now. It's been good. See you. That, that doesn't happen. I don't know how those guys do that. All right? You never, you never threw with that. But you guys like me who've been through those years, your children are adults, and maybe, maybe you have some frustration and regrets. I want to re remind you, the idea of a father and a son is God's idea. And to the extent that you love them in the Lord and you love them for the Lord and you love them because the Lord loved you and you failingly, frailly, stumblingly spoke truth into them and you didn't, you didn't have family devotions as consistently as you, as you knew you should have. And, and all, you know something? God knows your heart. And if you love the Lord Jesus Christ here today, He delights to give you the desires of your heart as they are focused on His glory and the advance of His gospel. I'm going to say to you, dads, don't give up. Don't beat yourself up. I've been there. I've beat myself up. And the devil loves it. He loves it when you just get into your little, your little pity party, your little, little hole in the wall, and just nobody knows the trouble I've seen. It. No. The gospel of Jesus Christ he came to show us the Father's love. And he came to show us what a son looks like who loves his father. And then he came to die for us, knowing that we couldn't do any of that. We couldn't be fathers like God, and we couldn't be sons like Jesus, apart from the grace of God offered to us through his shed blood and righteousness. What's the hope today? What's the hope? Well, it's certainly not that you'll be able to turn back time and do it better. No, we don't get to do that. We don't get to do over. It's not that maybe your kids will forget. No, they never forget. What is the hope? The hope is that the gospel overcomes all of it. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Our, the grace of God is greater than our sins. And he is able to even take our sins. He used my daddy's sins to shape my life. 
It took me a while to figure that out. He used my dad's sins against me to shape my life. Our God is that great. He is that powerful. He is able to take the weakest, most backward uh, child of God and use you. My prayer for you is that you will live to see your children's children and that not only your children, but your children's children will bring you the greatest joy in the world of walking in the truth as it is found in Jesus Christ. God bless you. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we, as we bow again before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're so grateful that you're our God and you're our Father. We're grateful that the gospel is the message of salvation to everyone who will believe. And Lord, I know in speaking what we talked about today, I know some, the children sometimes are challenged to listen through it all, but, I, but it's been spoken in their hearing, and you're able to take what, what, what has been spoken in their hearing, the truth, not only that, but what's hidden in their hearts by their parents, what they've learned in Sunday school, what they learned from their from, from love, people who love them and, and share Jesus and show Jesus to them. You're able to take that and turn that around. So I'm giving them to you, Lord. Save these children gloriously, wondrously. For those fathers here who are early in the, in the parenting journey, oh, God, bless them. Rescue them from themselves. Rescue them from the culture. Rescue them from, from hard-hearted religion and help them to walk in the glorious sunlight of the gospel of your grace. For fathers here who we look back and think, oh, we could have done it so much better. Take all types today and wash us anew and afresh in the hope of the empty tomb of Jesus Christ, willing to believe that while we have seen extraordinary demonstrations of your grace in times past, that you are the God of future grace. And we will yet live to see either from here or from that great arena in heaven, we will yet live to see displays of your grace that we never imagined, never fathomed, never contemplated. So bless the families in this church. Save spouses. Save loved ones. Save friends. Save neighbors. Save children. By your grace and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.